So this is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. So if you today are found in Christ Jesus, then you should be rejoicing. And the reason why is because you have just gotten closer. You are now closer to being with him for all eternity. And that's something to be glad about. That's something to hold on to. <clears throat> that's something that should motivate you and to encourage you to stay faithful throughout this day, to keep your mind stayed on Jesus and to be what he desires to see you be in your life. As believers, we don't appreciate the change that we are bringing in the world around us. And if we did, we would strive to be a, a more obedient people, a more faithful people. We would desire to submit to the Spirit of God so that we can truly live out the holiness and righteousness of Almighty God. But Jesus knows that man needs his help. Now it's up to us of whether or not we want to accept that help. And depending on what he's desiring to do, it could depend on how he's going to manifest and show himself by his spirit. So prayerfully today, I can go over two different things here because what I really want to touch on is the importance of occupying. Um, the importance of occupying and because right now, one of the things that the true church and the believers have to address is the condition of the church. God wants to address the condition of the church because judgment first is going to come to the house of God. We have to address the fact that right now the churches are not meeting. The churches are not some of the churches are still closed, meaning they're not holding corporate gatherings, in-person gatherings. And then you have some that are meeting, but they are still muzzled by the government. So when a people have just fallen into the course of life, because we are in a time where the Spirit of God is manifesting to the faithful and he's manifesting to those that he has called to a great work. It's important that we be found in the will of God because we don't know when those visitations are going to come. And as the devil takes up more space and more room, the outpours have to get greater. The power that the Spirit of God places on man, a born again, regenerated, Holy Ghost filled man, and how he is going to pour out more power on the church, the churches. It's important that we be found in the will of God because we don't know when that outpour is going to come. And we need the full measure of it when it does come. So, in Luke chapter 2, Jesus comes in a very, very, very important time. The birth of Jesus happens in a very critical time because Caesar Augustus has decreed that the whole world be taxed. Now you can imagine that's not good news. That's not a good thing to know that this emperor, this leader is now wanting to take away from people 
some of what they have. That's burden. That could be burdensome. But Jesus is making his way into the world. He's getting ready to introduce himself to man in, in the physical sense. He's getting ready to come and be the and start on his journey of being the savior of the world. So he's introduced, he's going to introduce himself to man. And he goes to the city of Bethlehem, which they call the city of David. And he and the well, the angel of the Lord appears to these shepherds. These shepherds are watching over the flock. As I, as I read that, I, it, I made me consider the fact that he, it's interesting that he appears to the shepherds. Now, we know a shepherd is someone that watches over the flock, watches over the sheep. The sheep are the Lord's, the Lord's, the Christians. And the shepherd will be identified as the, the overseer the pastor. So he appears to them. He appears to the shepherds. And as they should have been, because they see an angel that's come from heaven, <clears throat> they're, they, they're in the glory of the Lord, which the glory of the Lord manifests it. So they're getting a measure. When we get when we when we think of the scripture, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's that's playing out here. So it is the will of God that the Christians ex get to experience heaven now, not just when we get to heaven, but we get to experience measures of heaven in this phase of living, in this, in this part of our life as well. The glory of the Lord is, is shown round about them. And they were so afraid. But the angel, the angel comforts them and tells them, says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is the Christ which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. So this was a sign to them. So the angel reveals himself to them in an undeniable way in the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord comes and manifests and is shown around about them. And then as we read down, and it says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards man. So Jesus comes to, to bring peace, and he, and he comes to show that he's being brought from heaven onto earth to bless man, to bring peace on earth, to bring peace with man. And that's a blessing because we need the peace of God. And not just for our sake. We need the peace of God because that's a condition that God wants us to be in. So that as he desires to enter into our life, we don't fight with him. We don't resist him. And we don't become defensive when he wants to run our lives when he wants to run our lives because God doesn't want us to operate outside of him. So these shepherds get this awesome visitation from this angel that show, that tells them that Jesus is being, that Jesus is being born. Jesus is, Jesus is born and you need to go see him. You, you need to go see him. Then this is, this is a powerful truth that we must hold on to because if we if we view this from the standpoint of where we sit today the 
the church needs the glory of God. The church needs the glory of God because the glory of God is the presence of God. The glory of God is what gives the power, the grace, the holiness, the wisdom. It gives the things that only God can give to man, which which allows man to obey and to function and to operate at a level that he cannot operate as, as if he's just going through going through life as it goes from, you know, because life is just gonna go on from day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. And it's easy to get caught up in the routine of life. So God will visit man to point man back to him, to make man mindful of him. What happens when God's most important place becomes desolate or it becomes inoperable? Well, things will decay. Things will suffer. There's another, there's another scripture that I'm reminded of in 2 Kings 17. Now, to put it in the right context, in 2 Kings 17, you have Samaria, which is northern Israel, which they were, as we've discussed in previous messages, they were not right in the eyes of God. God was not necessarily accepting the lives of these people because they were idolaters. They wanted to worship God, but they also wanted to worship idols. They wanted to worship other things. They did not want just the God of Israel to be their God. So they have been taking Samaria has been taken over by Assyria. And Assyria, the Assyrian king, places another group of people in their land where they lived. As he places these people in this land, they all of a sudden realize that they shouldn't be there. And they realize they shouldn't be there because the animals, the lions, have actually killed some of them. They're getting they're getting killed by, by lions. Now the Assyrians are spiritual people. They understand that there are spirits that govern areas. So they immediately then they understand more importantly than just spirits, they understand that gods a God governs a nation or God will govern a nation or God will govern an area. So as the king of Assyria is made aware that these lions are killing these people, he says, okay, well, you need to get a priest. Go get one of the priests to go to this land, go back to this land with you and show you how to worship their God there because there's a God that occupies that area. So, he, so they take one of the priests back and he shows them how to give an offering. Now, these people are wicked. They're getting ready to try to apply a system illegally that they're not permitted to, to, to try to implement into their, their way of life. So they take, they, they see this priest worship God, give an offering unto God, and they pattern, they, they copy that same worship. And to a degree, God accepts it. God accepts it to a degree. But then they revert back. But they, but what they because because what they're trying to do is they're not using the method of offering to give it to the God of Israel. They're using the method of worship to give it to a false God. But because we have to look at the 
the influence, the spiritual influence, and what's on the Samaritans, the Samaritan people, the Samaritan people. They were birthed in rebellion and idolatry. Jeroboam, who basically was caused the split of northern Israel and southern Israel, southern kingdom, he um, was one of, I believe, Solomon's men. And he is in a bad place with Solomon, so he flees to Egypt. Now, once he finds out that Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is king, he desires to come back and try to take over the kingdom himself. So he um, is able to gain enough influence to get some of the people to come and side with him. He takes the majority of the tribes with him. And this is what starts the split. This is what actually, there were already things happening prior to this, but this is what really started the split between the Northern Kingdom and the Southern, the Southern Kingdom, Judah or Jerusalem. And then you have Northern Israel, Samaria. So what's the, what am I trying to communicate? What I'm, I'm communicating with this particular principle here, with this, what in 2 Kings 17 is that to a degree and for a time period, God will allow false worship. He will allow worship that's mixed in with a, with worldliness and a whole and, and other things. But when he desires change, he will show his displeasure. He will show his displeasure when he desires change. And what that's meant to do to the individuals or the church that he's showing his displeasure into is is He's desiring that they come, that that church or that person come to him submissively and humbly and seek his face, get in his presence so that wisdom and understanding can be obtained so that going forward from that point, now we can implement the right method. Now we can worship God in spirit and in truth. So because the church for, for such an extended period of time has been mixing worldliness in with, and I'm speaking present day right now, now, because the church has been mixing in worldliness with Christian rap and with a lot of the Christian artists mixing secular music with their method of worship or the people themselves are just not living obedient lives. They're just not faithful in their private lives. And they are doing things that God will classify them as disobedient. God is not accepting the worship. So when God gets displeased, he will, pl he will place people in a position where they can't worship him. And this is what we see. So we need to acknowledge the fact that God is displeased with where the church is. And this is why he brought this about in a lot of the church leaders who did not realize that this was not actually a mandate that they were supposed to close the doors. It was just out of fear that they decided to shut it down. But there's something deeper than that. The deeper part of that is, is that the connection relationship with God was not really that strong. That's why it was easy to come into agreement. It was easy to make a decision like this. But God allowed this because God is not pleased with the, 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 the worship, the fake vain worship. Now, let's also look at the fact that this also affected a lot of Christians because now they're not meeting, they're not gathering, they're not worshiping, they're not really benefiting from the word of God because they're behind their computers trying to watch people minister to them and that greatly of that leaves them in a place where they can't be fully accountable and eyes are not on them and they're not corporately meeting where the glory of God would show like it did in Luke chapter 2 or Acts chapter 2 
So we we got to we must understand this that we cannot apply our own methods to how we approach God. And then as we look at Luke chapter 2, we don't know when a visitation comes is going to come from God. That's why we need to do what we know to do. We need to obey and we need to focus on God and focus on the will of God for our lives because failure to do that, we will miss out on what God has for us. So prayerfully we can adjust and prayerfully we can go forward with full submission and obedience to God so that we, we can receive and obtain what he has for us.